I call it digital crack. You say it's like digital heroin. What's going on with this? And when did it really kick in, in your opinion, and start changing the way kids are evolving and developing? Well, I think we've been, you know, we've been in the digital age now for the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. And I think I think one of the problems that happened, Dr. Phil, was that you and I, our generation, sort of, we were asleep at the switch when this new generation of technology came along. We just started with smaller TV sets. And so we conflated modern screen time with TV, and most of us grew up on TV. So we let the fox into the chicken coop without really fully appreciating some of these impacts that were different with interactive. And that's the key part, this interactive and immersive media is not our daddy's television from yesteryear where we would sit 10 feet across the room in the living room and we would be um, visual. We weren't participants in the experience. We were observing a TV show. We were watching a TV show. Now we're immersed in it. So that has a different, not only psychodynamic effect, but neurophysiological effect. So the, the short sentence that I like to say is that this new technology is brain altering and mind shaping. And, and that's, I would say, in the last 10 years, we started seeing the telltale signs of habituation and what looks like addiction. And then what that leads to, what, what, is some of, what are some of the byproducts of our love affair with technology in terms of everything from depression and personality disorders and all the rest of it? That is a good short sentence. Say that again, because I want people to hear it and remember that particular sentence. Yeah. So brain altering and mind shaping. So brain altering in the sense that these devices do change the neurophysiology of our brains. And the MRI research has been pretty clear on this in very similar ways to substance addiction. So our brain goes through neurophysiological changes as a result of excessive screen time and mind shaping, meaning that they influence us. So especially our younger folks who are uh, getting involved in certain digital media, social media platforms, uh, everything from social contagion type of things where we're seeing young people. It's not just Kylie Jenner influencing people's values or what matters. It's you have some extremely popular psychiatric influencers who are creating a mimicking effect with everything from borderline personality disorder to dissociative disorder to gender dysphoria. You have a whole host of people mimicking these influencers in the way that you and I, when you and I grew up admiring you know, I like Michael Jordan growing up, Joe Namath. They were influencers, but they weren't in our pocket 24-7. And so the influencers of yesteryear are not quite the influencers of today and their impact and how they shape people. Yeah, that's for sure. I really want all of our people that are listening or watching right now to stop and think about what you're saying here. All of you that are with us right now, whether you've got kids or grandkids, you really need to stop and think about how complicit you may be in contributing to this because the average age that kids are getting smartphones right now is around 12 years old, a little younger, according to the research. And they're spending hours a day on these things. I've got grandkids that one is almost 13, the other is almost 11, and the 13-year-old has a very controlled cell phone, and her parents are paying attention to parental controls and screen time and all that, but still, her friends have them, and who knows you know, how much they're getting on them and what they're doing. It's hard to control, but I want everybody listening to stop and think about this because this is not just something to chat about with your friends while you're walking on the track or mm -hmm. at a cocktail party. This is a big deal. This is changing this generation and it's changing America's future. And we need to do something about this. China has actually taken some very bold steps in what they're doing in terms of just passing a law. I don't know how they're enforcing it, but they've actually passed a law, as I understand. Is that correct? Yeah. And China and and so China and Korea had been way ahead of the curve in addressing that this was an issue. China had said this was their number one health crisis 10, 12 years ago. 
And, and there are over 400 treatment centers in South Korea just addressing technology addiction. So they understand the problem. Now, I don't agree with how they're treating it. They, right. they have these sort of militaristic boot camps, and there have been some um, not wonderful things done there. But they're very plugged into the, no pun intended, they're very plugged into the idea that we're too plugged in. Right. Um, I, I think just to echo the one point that you made, Dr. Phil, we're changing seismically the way our society operates, and we're changing fundamentally the the brain at a pretty fundamental level. And, and I think if you look at the psychiatric metrics, right, um, the, the younger you are, the more likely are you to be, to be more psychiatrically unwell. So if, you, if we looked at the generational cohort, starting with baby boomers and we'll go on down to Gen Xers and millennials and Gen Z, each decreasingly younger cohort has higher and higher rates of psychiatric distress, higher anxiety levels, depression, suicide, overdose, so before the pandemic in 2019, our young people had the worst psychiatric metrics in recorded history. They had the highest overdose rates, depression rates, ADHD rates. Every way that you can slice and dice and measure psychiatric distress was at an all-time high in 2019, pre-pandemic. And then COVID happened, and what we did was we dropped a nuclear bomb on already toxic dynamics. We were more screen dependent, more isolated, more quarantined. So all those numbers spike throughout that. So we're going through a mental health crisis. And if you have to look at it from 30,000 feet, we have to ask ourselves as a society, well, what's changed in the last 10 to 15 years that might be making our young people more suicidal, more self-loathing, more empty, um, more acting out violently, school shootings, and, and all of those are related issues. And the common denominator is our immersion into this new digital landscape that's changing us. Yeah, and I've had this conversation with people that I know, not necessarily on the air, but people that I know, and they say, look, I understand the pandemic spiked everything, but how can somebody having a smartphone create such a mental health crisis? It just doesn't seem that those two things would be so connected. And by the way, the pandemic, I personally think it was hugely mismanaged. I think the quarantine was hugely mismanaged. And it did create an exacerbation, mm -hmm. but this turn in a negative direction for the mental health of our young people predated that. We really started seeing these increases many years before. We started seeing real upticks in, what, 08, 09, 10. That's when we really started seeing spikes in this. The iPad and the iPhone, right? Yeah. And if you go back... I've said it was like, I don't remember exactly when it was, but around 08 or 09, when the smartphone became really prolific, it was like big cargo planes flew over the United States and just dropped these things on society. Everybody had one. And so, you know, everybody was walking through life with their head up. Now you look, everybody's got their head down looking at their phone. It's a quantum shift. It's a huge, huge shift. So people say, okay, well, how is that changing development? I remember when I was 15, 364 days, 23 hours and 59 minutes, I was down at the DMV to get a driver's license because the second I turned 16, I wanted a driver's license so I could become really mobile. Now, it's like they hardly care. They're watching people live their lives. Instead of living their own lives, they start dating later. They start driving later. They're less accomplished in interpersonal interactions. Right. They're not involved in the world because they're watching it go by on a little screen. And to right. me, that makes us so much less competitive with prior generations and certainly in the world competitive market. I just don't see how this is not going to have terrible consequences, not only for the individual, but for our society. It's slowing everything down. You know, I think it's dampened. It's created a, a stunting, dampening effect on adolescence. It, what you said was exactly right about the driving. So um, lower, lower permit and licensing ages, lower participation in team sports, uh, later dating, less sexual. Uh, our, our teenagers aren't having sex the way that they used to. Um, because the gravitational pull of the digital, the digital crack 
is makes everything else boring or too much effort requiring. So a lot of the young people that I work in my clinics, they are uninteresting and uninterested. They're flat. There's an emptiness there. Everything, they've been so overstimulated by visual, digital stimuli, whether it's hardcore pornography or whether it's immersive gaming or whether it's the, the information overload of social media, that the real world is just, oh, it's too boring for them. So our challenge is to try to get a young person who's been so desensitized by this new media that's inundating their every, every part of their lives to get back into the game, to get back into a uh, uh, you know, where I live in my local community, they couldn't field a varsity football team at the high school for the first time ever really? because there weren't enough teenagers that were willing to put in the footwork and the time that it takes because they were gaming. Um, and they're not dating either because that takes social skills and, and everything else. So I think we're underappreciating quite how it's impacting all of our young people in this really profound way. And, and then the main thing that I think also keep in mind is we're evolutionarily hardwired to be social animals. We need face-to-face -face human interaction. And that was, you know, for obvious reasons, the tribe survived. Our strengths came in our community support of one another, both in the prehistoric times to medieval to the present. And now in the social media age, it was, it was the, the false you know, the irony of it all is the Kool-Aid that we were all given about something like social media was social media for a social species was supposed to be this elixir. It was going to be like chocolate and peanut butter coming together. It was going to be a match made in heaven. And what we're seeing is that social media is an actually anti-social media. It makes people more alone and isolated, and it drives what's called the comparison effect, where you have all these people now comparing themselves to everybody's outsides, everybody's digitally curated selves. And that makes them feel worse about themselves.